Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about, about a number we use all the time in finance, but in lots of different contexts, and that is the cost of capital. And it's a number that's going to bring together everything we've talked about in terms of ingredients, the risk-free rate, the risk premium, the beta. It's all in that number. I've described the cost of capital as the Swiss army knife of finance. It's used in so many different places. As investors, the cost of capital becomes an opportunity cost, a discount rate used to value an entire company. Within the company, the cost of capital is viewed as a cost of financing, the cost of raising debt and equity. And in project analysis, the cost of capital becomes a hurdle rate that you use to decide whether to take projects or not. So given its ubiquitous state uh, use, usage in finance, let's talk about how to estimate the cost of capital. So the first step when you sit down to estimate the cost of capital for a company is to decide what currency you're going to do the analysis in. Now, some of you might say, well, what choice do I have? If I'm looking at an Indian company, I have to do the cost of capital in Indian rupees, right? No, not right. You can actually estimate the, co the cost of capital in any currency you choose. So currency is a choice. But here's the constraint. Once you decide to use that currency to estimate your cost of capital, your cash flows have to be in the same currency. So if you decide to estimate the cost of capital for Tata Motors in US dollars, you can do that. But then when you value Tata Motors, the cash flows also have to be in US dollars. Consistency is key. Generally speaking, I find it easiest to work with the local currency. I start with the local currency and I try to give it a chance because I'd like to value the company in the local currency. But sometimes I'm forced to deviate from the local currency and pick a different currency. So the company I'm going to use as my lab experiment to illustrate this process is a company called Aitken Spence. It's a Sri Lankan hotel company with, with holdings and other businesses as well. The financials for the company, the annual report are all in Sri Lankan rupees. So I'm, I'm going to choose to do the analysis in Sri Lankan rupees that if I run into serious issues, I'll come back and revisit this choice. Because I could have taken Aitken Spence and done the analysis in US dollars and in Indian rupees and in euros if I'd chosen to but my currency choice is going to be Sri Lankan rupees. The second step in the process is to estimate a risk-free rate in that currency, the currency that you've chosen. Again, there are three ways you can get a risk-free rate, and I'll go from easiest to most difficult. The easiest scenario is when you have a government that issues bonds in the, in the currency that you're doing the analysis in, and that government is viewed as default-free. I'll cheat and assume that any AAA rated sovereign is default free. And if I can find a AAA rated sovereign issuing bonds, long term bonds in the currency that I'm doing the analysis in, I'll use that as my risk free rate. So as an example, if I'm doing my analysis in Swiss francs, I'll use the Swiss 10 year government bond rate as my risk free rate. If I'm doing my analysis in US dollars, it's a little trickier, I'll use the treasury bond rate as my risk free rate because Moody's attaches a AAA rating. S&P doesn't, but I'm going to go with the Moody's rating and that's a little bit of, you know, I'm dancing on the edge there. If you ask me for a risk-free rate in euros, I'm not going to use the Italian 10-year government bond rate. I'm going to use the German 10-year government bond rate. So the easy scenario is if you have a government in the currency that you're doing the analysis and that's viewed as default-free, which has a long-term bond. You're saying, why do you stop at the 10-year bond? It's purely pragmatic. I could have gone with a 30-year UST bond rate as my risk-free rate, but then all my other inputs, risk premiums, default spreads, become much more difficult to estimate. So I'm going to start with a 10-year government bond rate if the government is default-free. You're saying, what if the government has default risk? Then you can no longer use the government bond rate as a risk-free rate. Why? Because it's not risk-free. Here's what you need to do. You need to take out the default risk from that from that government bond rate. And to do that, I estimate a default spread for the government. If you're interested, I have an entire session on doing this, but that default spread can be obtained either from the sovereign CDS market, where you can buy insurance against default, or by looking at the, at the local currency sovereign rating for that government. So I can get a risk-free rate through the government bond, even if the government has default risk. You're saying, what if my government does not have long-term bonds? about 120 governments around the world that don't have government bonds. And there are some governments that have government bonds, but you don't trust the rate. The Venezuelan government has a 10-year bond on which the rate, at least on paper, is 9.83%. This is a currency with inflation in the thousands of percent. There is no way the government bond rate, if it's traded, is 9.83%. If you don't have a government bond rate, or you, or you don't trust the government bond rate, there is a way you can still get a risk-free rate in your currency. Here's what you should do. Start with the US dollar risk-free rate. 
then take the difference in inflation between the currency of your choice, whether it's Egyptian pounds, whether it's Venezuelan Bolivar and the US dollar, and add the differential inflation to the US T bond rate you've got a risk-free rate in the currency. In fact, that's an approximation. If you really want to do this right, you've got to do compounding, but it probably is not going to make that much of a difference. So let's try to estimate the risk-free rate in Sri Lankan rupees for Atkins Pence. For Atkins Pence, I started with the Sri Lankan government bond, which is not widely traded, but there is a rate out there. It's 10.58%. Based on the rating for Sri Lanka, which is B1, which is not a good rating, the default spread I get for the Sri Lankan government is 4.62%. If you subtract out the 4.62% from the 10.58%, you get a risk-free rate of 5.96% in Sri Lankan rupees. I am trusting the government bond to be right when I do this. You're saying, what if I don't trust it? I want to check it. Here's a simple way to do it. The T-bond rate on January 1st, 2018 was about 2.5%. The inflation rate in US dollars was about 2%. The inflation rate in Sri Lanka, at least based on the IMF projections, is about 6%. You take the 6, subtract out the 2, you get 4%. Add that on 2.5%, you get 6.5%. Again, if you want to do this right, you can try the compounded number. You get about 6.6%. But it's a simple way of getting risk-free rates or checking your risk-free rate in a currency where you're feeling a little uncertain. So that's step two. Step three, you got to estimate an unlevered beta for your company based on the business or businesses it's in. The standard way in which you're taught to do this is to run a regression of returns on your stock, in this case, Aitken Spence, against the, an index, maybe the Sri Lankan index, and the slope of the line is the beta. I do not like that approach, and I've explained why in multiple webcasts. My preferred approach is to start with the businesses you're in as a company and build up to a beta for your company. Build up how, look at how much value you get from each business, look at the beta being in each business and take a weighted average. Let's try this for Aitken Spence. Its biggest business is the hotel and gaming business. In fact, it breaks down revenues into four businesses, hotel and gaming, shipbuilding diversified, which means it's invested in all these other businesses, and business and consumer services. I know a couple of these categories are a little hazy. Diversified could be anything, it could be everything. So here's what I did. I tried to estimate the value of each business. To do this, I use two numbers that I get by looking across companies. One is, of course, the unlevered beta that I get by looking across all publicly traded hotel companies. You see that in the last column. And you will find this on my website, broken down by business and by region of the world. So those are the unlevered betas for companies in this business. I use the global average for shipbuilding businesses, for hotel businesses, for diversified businesses, for business, for business service businesses. I also estimate what's called an enterprise value to sales ratio for companies in each business. You see, what does that tell me? A typical hotel company trades at about 3.14 times revenues. A typical shipbuilding company trades at 1.82 times revenues. I take Aitken Spence revenues from each business, multiply it by that multiple. I get an estimated value for each business. You look at the weights that I have, they're based on the estimated value. Based on my view of Aitken Spence and my estimates, it looks like Aitken Spence is about 58% hotel, 14% shipbuilding, about 25% diversified, and about 2.6% business services. I take a weighted average of the unlevered betas using my weights. The unlevered beta that I get for Aitken Spence as a company is 0.83. Now comes the equity risk premium. Again, the standard approach is a very sloppy one. You look at the country in which a company is incorporated and you give it that equity risk premium. So in the case of Aitken Spence, you would just give it the risk premium for Sri Lanka, the argument being it's a Sri Lankan company. The reason I say it's sloppy is companies get their revenues, their business from multiple countries. Coca-Cola is a US company, but it gets its revenues from multiple countries. Aitken Spence is a Sri Lankan company, but it actually gets its revenues, not just from Sri Lanka, but also from the Maldives. It has hotels in India and in the Middle East. I've taken revenues from each of these regions, and that's all I have because that's all the company gives me, and I compute a weighted average. Weighted, weighted average of what? The equity risk premium of the different parts of the world that Aitken Spence operates in. Sri Lanka has an equity risk premium of 10.27%. The Maldives has an equity risk premium of 11.42%. And the rest of the world, in the, the, the Middle East and India, have an equity risk premium of 7.14%. The weighted average that I get for Aitken Spence as a company is 
Now come you, you come to a cost of debt. The cost of debt is the rate at which I can borrow money long term today. So to get to a cost of debt, I need to start with the risk-free rate, the same risk-free rate that I started my cost of equity with. So your currency choice still holds, plus a default spread. So to estimate the default spread, let's start, let's start easy and, and go, go more difficult. The easiest way to get a default spread is if you have a company that issues long-term bonds, those long-term bonds are trade and you can observe the yield to maturity. I think it's pretty dangerous when you do this because you're assuming that the risk in default risk in a bond and the default risk in the company match up. And that's not always true because risky companies can issue safe bonds. So the second approach is the one that I prefer. If you have bonds outstanding, you also have a bond rating, right? S&P, Moody, somebody's rating you. If I trust that bond rating, I can take that bond rating and estimate a default spread based on that bond rating. So that's the second approach. You're saying, what if I don't have bonds and I don't have a bond rating? 90% of the companies in the world borrow money from bank loans. Here, many people just use the book interest rate, which is to take the interest expense and divide by the book that don't do that. My preference is you try to compute a synthetic rating. Act like a ratings agency, attach a synthetic rating for your company, use that synthetic rating to come up with a default spread, and that default spread that added onto your risk-free rate will give you the cost of debt pre-tax. You're saying, what do you mean pre-tax? In much of the world, interest expenses are tax deductible. Because of that, your after-tax cost of debt is lower than your pre-tax cost of debt. And to capture that benefit, you need to use the marginal tax rate. Why the marginal tax rate? Because interest saves you taxes on your last dollar of income. You're saying, which marginal tax rate? Again, the easiest solution is to use the marginal tax rate of the country in which you're incorporated. But if you're a multinational, you will probably find the highest marginal tax rate country to put your interest expenses, and that tax rate should be used to come up with the after-tax cost of debt. So let's see what it looks like for Aitken Spence. Aitken Spence is not rated. To estimate the cost of debt, I took their interest expenses and their operating income and computed an interest coverage ratio. Interest coverage ratio I came up with was 2.53. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with the way I do this, what I have is a lookup table where I take your interest coverage ratio and I look up the rating that would go with that interest coverage ratio. With a 2.53 interest coverage ratio, the rating I come up with is triple B and the default spread on January 1st, 2018, based on that rating, would have been 1.27%. So let's build up to Aitken Spence cost of debt. Remember, I'm doing everything in Sri Lankan rupees, so I can't abandon that now. So I start with a risk free rate of 5.96%. I add to that the default spread for Aitken Spence. If this were a developed market company, I would be done, but this is a Sri Lankan company. You're saying, so what? And an emerging market company carries two burdens on its shoulder. One, its own debt default risk, and the other is the default risk of the country it operates in. In this case, Sri Lanka is a risky country, so I add the default spread for Sri Lanka on top of the default spread for the company to come up with a pre-tax cost of debt in Sri Lankan rupees of 11.85%. I apply the Sri Lankan marginal tax rate of 28% to that, and I end up with an after-tax cost of debt in Sri Lankan rupees of 8.53%. Step six, I stop and look to see how much debt the company has. I start with the balance sheet because that's a logical place to start. And I'm looking for just interest bearing debt. I'm not gonna get distracted by things like accounts payable and supply credit, not because they're not liabilities, but if they're not interest bearing, then it's not consistent for me to treat them as debt. So I look for short term as well as long term interest bearing debt. And I get those numbers off the balance sheet. If I'm in a hurry, which is what most investment bankers and consultants seem to be in, you can use that debt, which is a book value of debt, as your estimated market value. But there's a simple way in which you can convert that book debt into market debt. And to do that, you need two other pieces of information. One is your interest expense from your income statement, which should be easy to get. The second is the average maturity of your debt, which some companies report in their footnotes. And if you do have that, you can treat the debt as if it were a gigantic bond and compute the market value of that bond by taking the present value of the interest expenses as if there were coupons and the present value of the book value as if it's a face value of debt. You're saying, what are you talking about? Let's try this for Atkins Spence. On the balance sheet, they had 11.67 billion in short-term debt. This is short-term portion of long-term debt short and short-term debt and 15.975 billion in long-term interest-bearing debt. So together, the interest-bearing debt was 27,645 million. So if I were in a hurry, I'd have used that as my market value of debt, but I'm not, I can take the time. The average maturity of the debt was about three years. The interest expenses that Atkins Spence had in the most recent year was 1,698 million. So you're saying, what are you gonna do with this? 
I'm going to treat this as if it were a gigantic coupon bond. The coupons are going to be 1,698 million every year for the next three years. At the end of the three years, I'm going to get 27,645 million back. And I'm going to discount all of these back at a current market interest rate, which I've just estimated to be 11.85%. What I get as my present value is 23,847 million. That's going to become the market value of my interest bearing debt. Then I stop to see what the accountants have missed. In particular, I'm looking for lease commitments, which for whatever reason around the world have been treated as not debt. That's supposed to be fixed in 2019, but I'm not going to wait for accountants to come to their senses. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your lease commitments and convert them to debt. Sounds fancy, but here's all I'm doing. I'm taking the commitments you have and discounting them back to today using your pre-tax cost of debt. Why pre-tax cost of debt? Because these lease commitments are pre-tax commitments. What I get as a present value will be the debt value of leases. I'm going to add that on to my interest bearing debt, the market value of interest bearing debt to come up with total debt in the company. Aiken Spence, because it has hotels, has substantial lease commitments. And they do break their lease commitments down. So you see my projected lease commitments in Aitken Spence for the next five years. And beyond five years, they give me a lump sum of 4,089 million. What I do is I spread it out as an annual commitment for five years of 817.84. I discount them all back at 11.85%. What I get as a present value, 4,631 million, is my debt value for leases. I'm almost home. I stop and check to see whether the company has made my life difficult by issuing hybrids. What are hybrids? They're part debt, part equity. The two most common hybrids are convertible debt and preferred stock. Convertible debt has a debt portion, that's an interest bearing debt, and, the, and an equity portion, which is a conversion option. If you can, break out convertible debt into its conversion option and its trade debt, and it's relatively simple to do. Here's all you have to do. Take the convertible bond, Forget about the conversion option, act like it was straight debt and value it as if it was straight debt. That becomes the debt portion of convertible debt. Then subtract that from the market value of the convertible debt, that becomes the conversion option or the value of equity. You've taken care of convertible debt, goes into debt and equity, disappears. Preferred stock, at least in the form it takes in the US, is a pain in the neck. It's a pain in the neck because it has fixed dividends, which makes it look a lot like debt. But those fixed dividends are not tax deductible which means I can't throw it in with debt. So with preferred stock, I have to put, create a third component, which is something I don't like to do because it makes analysis a lot messier for preferred stocks. I'll have debt, equity, and preferred stock with their weights. And the cost of preferred stock is very simple. It's just the preferred dividend year. With Aitken Spence, I got lucky. There's no convertible debt. There's no preferred stock. So I was able to go to step nine. I have the total debt. I have to compute debt ratios. Remember, everything is computed in market value terms. I do not care what the book value of equity is. You shouldn't either in cost of capital. You compute the market value of equity. That should be easy, right? If it's a publicly traded company, share price number, number of shares. Just a note of warning. If your company has multiple class of shares, some traded, some not, make sure you even bring in the non-traded shares. Compute the market value of all equity. If your company is not traded, it's a private business, it gets messier. If, you're, if you want a shortcut, one thing you can try is to take the net income of the company in the most recent year. Look at publicly traded companies in the same space and look at the, the PE ratio they trade at. So let's say you're a book, book retailing company. You have 100 million in net income and a typical book retailing company trades at 20 times net income, 20 times 100 million is $2 billion. That becomes your estimated market value of equity. Then compute two debt ratios. One is debt to equity, which is total debt divided by market equity. And remember, you're including leases as part of your debt. And debt to capital, which is debt over debt plus equity. Again, if you have preferred stock, just add the third component. Make sure the weights all add, add up to 100%. So for eight Spence, here's what the numbers look like. The shares were traded in about 60 per share. There are 405.7 million shares, which gives me a total market capitalization of 24.34 billion uh, you know, Sri Lankan rupees. The total debt, I have lease debt of 4.6 billion and I have interest bearing debt that I've converted to market value. The market value of the interest bearing debt is 23.8 billion. The total debt that I have is 28.5 billion. If I use those numbers, the debt to equity ratio that I get for Aitken Spence is 117%. It has a lot of debt. Its debt to capital ratio is about 53.9%. I need both numbers, so hold on to both numbers. I'm now ready to estimate a cost of capital. Couple of things to remember. 
the cost of equity here has to come from a levered beta. So to get to a cost of equity, I need to take the unlevered beta that I have for the company, use the debt to equity ratio that I got in step nine and come up with a levered beta that gives me my cost of equity. For the cost of debt, I'm going to use the pre-tax cost of debt times one minus the marginal tax rate, the weights I've just computed, and I can get a cost of capital for my company. Incidentally, we are a little inconsistent, especially when we work with local currencies in coming up with this number, because a local currency risk-free rate is being mixed in with dollar default spreads and dollar equity risk premiums, and some of you might be freaking out about that. If it freaks you out too much, here's what you should do. Do your entire cost of capital calculation in US dollars, and then compound it, or bring in the effect of inflation at the last step. So remember the 6% inflation we had for Sri Lanka? and 2% for dollars, I could have done the cost of cap rate can spend entirely in US dollars. At the last stage, use the differential inflation to come up with the cost of capital in Sri Lankan rupees. So let's bring the numbers together for Aitken spends. Let's see what they look like. This page kind of captures everything we've had in the pages so far. My equity risk premium reflects where they do business. Sri Lanka, Maldives, other countries, basically the, the weighted average is 10.2%. My unlevered beta is 0.83, that comes from the businesses there. My debt to equity ratio is a market debt to equity ratio, the 117% with debt including leases. My risk free rate is the Sri Lankan risk free rate, why? Because I'm doing my analysis in Sri Lankan rupees. My cost of equity in Sri Lankan rupees is 19.94%. For my cost of debt, I start with the same Sri Lankan rupee risk free rate. I add the default spreads for the country and the company, and I use the marginal tax rate for Sri Lanka. My after-tax cost of debt is 8.53%. The weights I have on debt and equity, with debt including leases again, is 53.9% debt, 46.1% equity. My weighted average cost of capital in Sri Lankan rupees is 13.79%. If I'm valuing eight eight spends as a company, this is the cost of capital I would use at least to get started in the process. He's saying, what if I have to estimate a cost of capital for an individual division? Well, to decide on the cost of capital used in a project, there are three things you need to know. First is what business is the project? Is it a hotel business? Is it a shipbuilding project? Is it a diversified project? So basically, you need to know what business the project is in. Second, you need to know what country the project is in. And third, whether that project can carry its own debt. So let me make it very specific. Let's assume that Aitken Spence is planning to build a hotel in Dubai and it's asked you for a cost of capital it can use to, to make that judgment. First, you've got to ask, like, can the hotel carry its own debt? What does that mean? Well, in most cases, when companies take on projects, the company borrows money for the project. The project is not a standalone. Unless you have a big infrastructure project, projects are seldom standalone. Here's what I'm going to use to compute the cost of capital for that project in Dubai. First, I have to decide what currency to do the analysis in. Remember, currency is a choice. I can do this in Sri Lankan rupees. I can do it in, 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 in the local currency in Dubai. So basically, I can do it in whichever currency I pick. So I have to make that choice because that's going to determine my risk free rate. The beta that I'm going to use is going to be the beta for the hotel business, not eight can spend a company, but the beta for the hotel business. This is the other advantage of using that bottom-up approach. The, so that will be the unlevered beta. The debt to equity ratio and debt to capital ratio used will depend on whether the project can carry debt on its own, in which case you'll use the debt to capital ratio of the project, or whether the company is doing it, in which case you'll use the debt to capital ratio for the company. Same thing for the cost of debt. If the project can carry its own debt, you'll estimate a cost of debt for the project. But if the company is borrowing money for the project, use the company's cost of debt. So your cost of capital will depend on the currency you picked, the business the project is in, the country in this case will show up at the equity risk premium. The equity risk premium you'd use will not be the equity risk premium for Aitken Spence as a company. It'll be the equity risk premium for Dubai. You now have the flexibility to compute the cost of capital, not just for a company, but for any individual project. I know this has been a long session and I'm sorry it took so long, but I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much for listening.